Wild Feather Podcast. I'm Brooke Dunwell, serial entrepreneur, sponge for life, and lover of people. Join me as we uncover the stories of courageous female entrepreneurs, founders, and investors pushing beyond limitless boundaries. Let's explore their creative journeys and pursuits to greatness. Sam Corral is our guest today. Sam is the co-founder and CTO of DwellWell, a home buying platform that is incredibly helpful and insightful. It's fantastic. She has spent the majority of her career in startups from Preact, which was acquired by Spotify, and Reddit. Sam is passionate about diversifying the tech ecosystem through inclusive hiring and training. And she has successfully developed training programs to elevate unrepresented groups. She is a leader in the women in tech space and has spoken at the Grace Hopper Celebration and Women in Tech Summit. Thank you, Sam, for joining us on the podcast today. We so appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Of course. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Yeah. So I am so excited to speak with you today. You have a a very unique and fascinating story, at least I think. Um, So we're just going to start off from the beginning. How did you go from waitress to an engineering manager? Give us the scoop because there's some fun stories along the way. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So uh, I'll give you the scoop. And um, I have this written down in a blog post I wrote. So anyone who's curious can can read about it. I'll kind of go through it kind of quickly here. But I'll highlight the blog post in all of our social media as well. So you can read along. Awesome. Yeah, Yeah, great. I'll give you the the basic rundown. So after college, I really I I got a degree in marketing. um, But I couldn't I, like I, I couldn't really find a marketing job that I wanted. I didn't love marketing either. I wasn't really passionate about it. So um, my first job out of college actually was selling life insurance, which was, you know, it's a really important product. I think there's a huge need for life insurance. Of course, personally, as a 22 year old right out of college, I was like a miserable salesperson at selling life insurance. I did not understand like what it really was for. I had never really heard of it until I started selling it. It was also a 100% commission job. And so you're making like no money, getting rejected on the phone at a minimum 40 times a day facing like adults being like, don't call me again on the phone. And so I did that. I, I I tortured myself basically for 10 months with that. And then I quit because I was just so, so, so miserable. And I had an apartment in New York City and I knew like I was like, I have to pay rent somehow. So on my day I quit, I like walked home and just applied at every single restaurant on my way home um, after quitting. And that was fruitful. I ended up landing a job um, at this little lunch place on the Upper West Side waitressing. Um, But I knew that I wasn't going to be like a lifelong hospitality person person. It just wasn't my dream to be in hospitality. And so I, at the time I was watching a lot of Grey's Anatomy between my shifts (laughs) and I was like, oh my God, duh, I should be a doctor. Of course, like this looks so fun. (laughs) And so I started looking into like these post bachelor pre-med programs. Um, Luckily slash at the time I felt very unluckily. I had missed all of the the cutoffs for applying for them. Uh And so in my head, I was like, well, okay, maybe I'll get into like bioinformatics and use my medical degree to like, I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking, but I was like, I should learn to code a little bit in the meantime so I can use it for my like imaginary medical degree that I had like imagined for myself. And so I started very lightly dabbling in learning um, Ruby. And during this time, I also decided to move to California just on a whim. And so I, I was in L.A. kind of learning to code at my own pace and through while still waitressing and through a friend of a friend heard about a program called dev boot camp and so this was 2013 this was way before boot camps were popular i think this was probably dev boot camps like third maybe not third cohort but they had only been in business for less than a year okay and so no one had ever heard of a coding boot camp before so i kind of crossed my fingers that it wasn't a scam um, applied and got in <clears throat> and moved to San Francisco and went to the boot camp 
for uh, three months or 12 weeks, however long the boot camp was, lived in this tiny little hostel in Chinatown there with like 20 other random people uh, and learned how to code. And we can get into the boot camp a little bit. It was a crazy experience. I always recommend people who are like scared of going to the boot camp but really want to. I all I love hiring boot camp grads. Um, now I just think they're super resilient, have really diverse backgrounds typically. But after doing the boot camp, I landed a job at a teeny tiny little startup called Preact. Um, basically, they were kind of like machine learning for sale. So they would basically we could do like predictive user modeling to tell our clients like, oh, it looks like your user is going to quit or it looks like this group of users might upgrade if you message them an email or something like that. Um, so I got that job kind of serendipitously. I, I, um, I knew that my resume didn't look good, right? So I was like a waitress and then insurance salesperson and then that was it. And so I would like scour people's landing pages for bugs, um, startups specifically because they don't have the resources to put together like a really fancy landing page. And so I would find a bug, like a CSS bug or something like that, guess the email address of the founder, and then be like, hey. All the tools came out that you could like find email addresses, right? Well, <laughs> it was like LinkedIn was there. So I was like, okay, I know that, I know that, for example, Christopher Gooley was my boss at my last one. So I knew I was like, it's probably Chris at preact.io. Um, or maybe we got connected through AngelList or something. I was like guessing lots of people's email addresses. So I would email them being like, hey, I love your product. Da, 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 da. By the way, there's a bug. Here's how I would fix it. Let me know if you're looking for engineering talent. Would love to like put a face with a name and just pretended that I was a lot more knowledgeable that I actually was. And doing it that way, they'd never be like, yeah, send me your resume. They'd be like, oh, interesting. Like, let's talk. And so that was kind of like my foot in the door around the gatekeeper of what my resume was essentially would have gotten me rejected from any of these jobs. Right. I think that's brilliant. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I always okay. give people that advice. They never take it. I'm like, this is like the, the best way to get your foot in the door. And no one ever takes my advice because it's a little bit scary to do it. Well, do that. I, I totally get that. But I think boot camp folks that don't have um, a software background, it has to be a certain type of company, I think, that hire those folks. I don't think they're, I mean, how difficult is it for, you said you love them. You love hiring them, but how difficult do you think it is to make that transition and get a job out of boot camp? Just curious from oh, your perspective. It, it's the hardest part. You will never solve an engineering challenge unless you work at NASA or something that is harder than getting the first job. Mm. Like there is learning to code, coding at your job, becoming a senior engineer, becoming a staff engineer. None of those things are more difficult than getting your first job. Yeah. And so I think people need to understand that and have like go into it with the mindset like this is going to suck trying to get my first <laughs> job. But then once you do it and once you've been at that engineering job for a year, it's like you will have nonstop recruiters in your right. LinkedIn inbox. And so it's just like you have to have that resilience for the that's going to be the hardest part. And so you got to be creative with it. Don't be afraid of rejection. Understand also that rejection will be a part of it. Not like maybe it's going to be a part of it. You will get rejected. And that should feel like a relief to you. Like it's not um, shameful or unusual or it should just be an expected part of it. I mean, even four years into my career, I was, I, I remember I interviewed at Facebook like in 2016 or something like that, got rejected. I mean, and right. now I run my own company. So it's like people, you know, I mean, rejection is just part of it. And so right. I think it's important to keep that in mind. What are your thoughts real quick? This is totally side note, but what are your thoughts about people that go through the boot camp and obviously are looking for more experience? Um, them going on Upwork or Fiverr or doing side jobs to get more experience. Is that helpful or would you not recommend that? Personally, I would not recommend that. So t okay. tip my opinion is that when you grad, unless unless you have some sort of background in engineering already or mm -hmm. you've worked in tech before, which I had not, right? I was a waitress. Right. I, I did not graduate with enough skills to be able to self-direct myself okay. into building an app. And I would I would say 98% of people graduating a boot camp also don't have 
the skills to consult in a way that would make both themselves and their client kind of happy. Okay. I think typically you would need probably at least two years of experience at a company in order to be able to go off and, and do that on your own, unless you're a special case. I was not, engineering is not something that I'd just like get really easily. Like some people just get it. I am not one of them. And so I definitely wouldn't have been able to do that after, gotcha. after camp. Yeah. Okay. So you got this job and then yes. you worked there for a couple of years. Yes. I worked there for two and a half years, which was great, but we were a startup. And so career development really was not top of mind for me or really anyone at the startup, right? At a startup, you're really focused on making sure the business isn't isn't failing. And so I had never even considered career development, like where I want to go with this or anything like that. Um, that startup later went on to get acquired by Spotify, which is when I left and went to Reddit. And mm. so I spent five years at Reddit. I came in as an engineer and then I probably left, that's where I kind of like graduated to senior engineer. And then after that, I became an engineering manager, managing our web infrastructure team. So like our client side infrastructure team, and then eventually another team as well, which we called quality infra, which was kind of our, kind of like our QA, uh, like our automation, our deployments team, all of that good stuff. And then, um, yeah, that, that was kind of my tenure at Reddit. Okay. So how did you become a founder? Like it, you have a very um, unique start as a founder because most founders, they either find a problem and they're, they're very passionate about it, or they want to be an entrepreneur. They want to be a founder. And it seems as if you kind of fell into it a little bit. A little bit. Yeah, it's funny. I remember a couple of years ago, I had been working with this career coach because um, kind of like in the middle of my, I would say I'm still mid-career, right? But in the, at Reddit, I was finding, I was having a lot of like doubts about, oh, am I being reasonable when I'm asking people to do this as a manager? Am I being too forceful? Am I not being forceful enough? So I had a, a career coach that was helping me out with some of that stuff. And she said to me, she was like, I think in three years, you're going to be running your own company. And I was like, you are crazy. I was like, there's no way. I was like, I have no desire to do that. I was like, it seems like way too much work. I don't even know how I would do that. I don't know how payroll works. I don't know how to fundraise. I don't know any of this stuff. And I actually emailed her recently being like, hey, like you were right. <laughs> and so <laughs> and so the way I kind of got into it, I yeah, it's true. I had never dreamed of being an entrepreneur. My family is not entrepreneurial. Um, my, my family by and large, um, have worked at like the same company for 30 years, kind of old school in that way. Mm -hmm. But I, at the, at the startup that I was at Preact, um, I met my now co-founder, Matt. He was their first business hire over there. I was their second engineering hire and we had kept in touch every now and again. He has always wanted to be an entrepreneur and he went to business school. So when the pandemic hit, I moved down to LA, he was already down here and he called me and he was like, Sam, I have this great idea. I want to, I, I need a CTO. I need a co-founder. Um, and it's in real estate. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like, I'll, I'll hear you out. Cause we're buddies or whatever. Right. So I, w I went to his house. We sat like 10 feet apart as he's telling me this, this <laughs> idea. And he's like, I want to build something in the real estate space around, uh, buying homes. I think it's, I think it's like the, one of the last disrupted industries, people are still buying homes in a way that seems so crazy to me. And I was like, Matt, get a grip. Have you ever heard of Zillow or Redfin? Like, this is not a non-disrupted industry. I don't, I have no idea what you're talking about. And he goes, he said, okay, Sam, since you're so smart, <laughs> why don't you tell me how you would buy a home? And I said, okay, Matt, easy. What I would do is I would go on Zillow and then I guess I would go to an open house in my area and then I guess I would just meet the agent that happened to be at that open house and then magically somehow I would get a house. <laughs> He's like, okay, Sam, does that seem like the best way to make the largest purchase of your life? through serendipitously meeting a stranger at an open house who you're trusting to take you through the entire process, which you have no idea about. 
and then you're just going to magically end up in a house like that doesn't make any sense. Why isn't there a guided experience that walks you through how to buy a home, delivering you the information at the stage that you're at? how to get pre-approved. How is that different from pre-qualification? That term sounds really scary to me. Like, is that going to affect my credit? What does getting pre-approved mean? I'm definitely going to be able to get a mortgage. Also, like, what is a mortgage and what's a lender? Is a lender the same thing as a bank always? And like, if I'm a first time home buyer, but I can't afford 20% down, does that mean I'll never be able to buy a house? And also like, what are people my age doing who make the same amount of money as me and have the same goals? What are they putting down? Can you give me recommendations? There's no like programmatic way to do any of this. Right. And so that's what we're building at 12. Well. Awesome. And I was like, Dan really that's- hit the nail on the head with that, Matt. And so he convinced me like right then and there, I was like, this is a glaring problem, especially for millennials who are used to doing, you know, being led through a purchase. I mean, right. if you think about like, <laughs> wire cutter, there's someone who spent 80 hours brushing their teeth with different toothbrushes so they can make a recommendation that's right for you on a toothbrush. We have nothing like that for the largest purchase you're ever going to make. So Right. I think it's great. I think your platform is definitely needed. And just one thing that you mentioned is like trusting a real estate agent who you don't know, right? So I think there's a component in your product that allows you to do some research, find the local real estate agent that fits. I mean, we'll match it for you. So we'll tell you like that based on what we know about you, this is the person who's going to be a good match. And a lot of people don't even know what a good match is, right? Like you've never worked with a real estate agent before. How are you supposed to know what someone who is good looks and acts like versus someone who might not be that good. Um, Typically people find their agent in one of two ways. It's like the Zillow thing that I just told you, just meeting them randomly, or it's like their mom's neighbor's kid or something like that, (laughs) which it's like, you have no idea if they're good. Is this like their first time selling a house? And so it's just, it just doesn't make any sense. And so uh, we want to match agents with people who are pre-qualified and and know what they're looking for so that the agent doesn't have to do as much work. And then it also benefits the home buyer because now they're getting matched with somebody who is a good fit for them. Right. So he convinced you to come on board. And one of the things I thought was so uh, ironic that you had told me before was you said starting a company seemed impossible when you first thought about it. So in your mind, what what was going through your mind? Like what seemed impossible? Oh my gosh. I mean, everything, right? It's like the entire business side of it. Uh, so like, how do you have payroll? How do you raise money? How, I'm like, I don't know anybody with money. I don't even know how to fundraise. What's a safe note? What's a valuation? Right. Like, uh, I can probably build an app all by myself, but that's about it. What about like HR? What about like a bank account? Like where do you put the money? Um, What's a business strategy? How do you monetize? How do you think about monetization? How do you predict that over time? How do you predict how much money you need to raise with the team that you need to hire and like the timeline of that so you don't run out of money? All of this stuff, it seemed like impossible to me, which is which my co-founder, he's an expert at that. I mean, that's what he does. He I was going to say, so how did you learn all of this stuff? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so he, no, he, I could not do this by myself. It would, it would be impossible. And I think that's um, particularly evident when you look at the startups, the, the single founder startups fail at a much higher rate than co-founded companies. And I think that's a big reason. It's like, there's just too much. I mean, there's like, even we have uh, lawyers, right? It's like, I've never worked with a a lawyer before. I -hmm. don't know how to source a lawyer to do our compliance stuff. Um, So my task is hiring and staffing our recruiting team, making sure we're building the right stuff, putting it on the right, like deployment software and stuff like that. And that alone, right, that's overwhelming in and of itself. And right. so I couldn't imagine doing it all by myself. And so, yeah, my co-founder, um, he got his MBA. He's worked in venture. He's worked at startups before. He knows all that stuff. But look, we're both we're both learning as we as we go. Right. Neither one of us had ever raised money before. And um, and you raised money was, like, yeah, you have the mm-hmm. best, easiest 
fundraising story I've ever heard. Oh yeah, incredible. We uh, so, uh, and I was like, so we were gonna go out to do a friends and family round, and I was like, are you insane? I was like, I don't know anybody who would throw money into this, <laughs> and I'm I'm so naive, right? I've been working in Silicon Valley for eight years. Of course, I know people who would throw money into. I just didn't know until I asked, and so we just set out to raise. um, just so he and I could quit and maybe bring on a designer or something like that. And in the three weeks between Thanksgiving and Christmas, which are like the worst weeks of the year to raise money, right? Everybody's out of budget and it's like nobody's in office. We raised $150,000 just through like, just through like the first couple people that we, we chatted with. And so that really got the ball rolling. We were like, now we have like a fiduciary responsibility to quit. And then within the next three months, we ended up raising like 500% more than what we set out to raise. We actually had to stop taking money because we were like, we have to get to work and like start building this. Um, And so now with the money we've raised, we are able to staff out a team up to nine by the end of the year, have runway through 2022 and, um, start thinking about fundraising again, maybe next year or something like that. But it it was great. It was, I mean, it was, I was shocked by it. Yeah. That's not the common story. And so I think it's incredible. It's amazing. Like so excited for you guys. Um, so a couple of things, one, we'll just touch base on this really quick because you said that you're staffing out your team. So what positions are you hiring for and what are you looking for and what's important? Great question. I would love to tell you about this. So <laughs> luckily for us, we so we we filled a bunch of spots um, since even you and I last spoke, Brooke, which is we are so thrilled about it. And so what we're looking for, and I'll link also maybe the job postings to you if we want to put it under yeah, the absolutely. We can include in, it. under the video or something. Yeah. But we're looking for two SDRs, so kind of staffing out a sales team here to bring agents on the platform. And then we're also looking for one more engineer. And so I would love this person to be a front end engineer. We have our back end engineering team pretty staffed up. Um, I'm a front end engineer. And so I need someone to like come help me because my back end engineers got the back end handled. Now it's like just me on the front end. And so I need um, kind of like a TypeScript, React, Redux developer to come in and kind of own the mess that I've made on on the front end and and work directly with me on that. (laughs) Well, and one thing that I uh, think is very admirable because you're thinking of it at the very beginning, which I think a lot of startups don't maybe. And we just did uh, some projects about diversity and inclusion and how we just wrote an article actually, how um, if you don't think about it at the very beginning, then you're down the road and you get too far down the road and then you've got to back up and redo to include diversity inclusion Mm because you've gone way too far down and it's easier to build from the scrap from the start than it is to re go backwards. So you have made it a passion of yours, or I guess maybe at the top of your priority list to build out, um, and hire diversity. Mm-hmm. And so I think that is very admirable. Um, and if you want to talk about that, that would be great. Like, have you always been focused on diversity, hiring diversity when you're an engineering manager? What does that mean to you? How important it is to you? Yeah, I, I don't claim to be an expert on this, by the way. I think we're all learning every year that the way that we think about diversity, even like two years ago, is maybe incorrect or wrong. And so I don't want to speak on behalf of like, being an expert in this at all. I'm still learning. But, you know, it really, I remember the moment. So I was, when I started at Reddit, there was one other female engineer. Um, And Reddit wasn't giant when I joined. I was one of the, I was maybe like the 60th employee or something like that. So I know people think about Reddit being like this giant company, but when I joined there, we had an engineering team of maybe 20 people. And so I was used to being kind of the only woman in the room. And as Reddit grew, we brought in more women and more people who just like the word diverse. I mean, people who weren't typically in the room. And I started, I never noticed how 
alienated I felt in the room until we started bringing other people who I felt represented, like, you know, were similar to me, so women. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, oh, oh, interesting. This is very different. And it wasn't until that moment that I realized, right, it, and I'm white too. And so it's like, I'm diverse in tech in one way, but like white people are largely represented in tech. Mm -hmm. And so having that moment of recognition to be like, oh, interesting. I feel so much more comfortable and able to like show up at work and voice my opinions when there's um, someone who is like me in the room. Imagine having that feeling and like it's it's a little bit easier to get white women in the room in tech. Imagine having that feeling as a black woman or a black man or a, a Hispanic person. Um, right. It must feel very alienating. And I don't think pe it's harder for people to bring their full selves to work when you feel like the other, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so having that realization for myself really made me want to build inclusive teams where people could show up, bring them full selves to work, make sure that we have representation across multiple different ethnicities, backgrounds, genders, um, because I think that's when the best work gets done. And from a business perspective, I mean, you can't build an app for everybody if everybody is not represented in your company. So just from a business perspective, it just makes sense as well, in addition to being like just something that I'm passionate about. Right. And they bring so many different views and perspectives. And I think it's fun. It makes it more fun, more a more fun environment. Right. At least I think. Well, it's so. also I mean, you think about it. It also makes you more mindful, right, to be inclusive. It's really easy to not think about it when you're mm -hmm. surrounded by people who are just like you. Um, it can make you less sensitive to things that are going on in the world, less sensitive to the things that you're saying. Um, and I think that that isn't good. I mean, that's just something that it, it, it brings, like, let's see, what am I trying to say here? It, there's value in being aware of the thoughts and things that come out of your mouth. And if you're accidentally perpetuating something that you really shouldn't be. Right. And so I think that additional awareness is really important when making decisions in business um, to make sure you're making the right decisions. Yeah. So what motivates you? Oh, good question. I mean, for my startup or generally? Either one. Let's see. I am, you know, it's interesting. People ask me this when I first got into tech, like why? Um, when I first got into tech, it was a lot of, I got into this because a lot of people thought that I couldn't do it. Mm. So working as a waitress, for example, in LA, especially if you're a waitress in LA, people are like, oh, you want to be in entertainment or acting or modeling right. or this or this or that. And so when people would ask me, what are you, you know, what do you really want to do? I'd be like, oh, I'm going, I'm, going to learn how to code. I just got into this boot camp. I'm going to be doing that. And people would be like shocked. They'd be like, you, you think that you are going to be an engineer? Like you think that. And people were very like rude about it. And so my motivation at first was really, I was like, well, you guys think that I can't do it. Like I'm going to show you wrong. Um, and that definitely motivated me for a long time. Now the tables have kind of turned and, um, I have no doubt about my ability to like be an engineer or this or that, but what I crave is kind of bringing, being a leader and like bringing change into the industry. And so bringing more women into tech, I spend a lot of time mentoring women who are new to tech or are coming out of boot camps and stuff like that. Um, building a company culture that I would want to work at, um, making that top of mind and being the person who is in charge of that. I mean, that's great, right? When you work at another company, there's only so much you can do because you're not the one. It's not your company. Right. Um, but now, like, the top of mind for me is, like, how do I create an environment where we get stuff done, we have fun, people want to come to work, they feel safe, included, and my motivation is, like, how do I motivate a team to, to work together to go tackle a really, really hard problem? Yeah, that's great. If you were to give entrepreneurs or founders a piece of advice, what are a couple of things that you would give them? 
It's a good question. I'm sure I'll look back on this in a year and be like, everything you said is wrong because <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm still new to this. Right? Right? I'm still new to this myself. I think for me, the, the big one of the bigger lessons I've learned so far is that the scariest thing in all of this is just making the decision to do it. Mm. So before I gave my notice and quit at Reddit so I could do this full time, the one foot in, one foot out was the scariest part of this whole thing. Scarier than asking people for money, scarier than thinking about like, oh, what if this doesn't work, was um, making the decision to do it. Once I told the first person at Reddit, like, hey, I'm leaving to start my own thing, the ball was in motion, like you can't go back. And as soon as that happened, my fear kind of dissipated. So and taking that was, a leap of faith. Yeah. I mean, the scariest part is, will I or won't I? Right. And once you make the decision, all of that fear goes away. I mean, at least for me and my co-founder, we talk about this all the time, how we were so scared to just make the decision to leave. And then once we did, it was like, well, I mean, that's that. Get right. to work. I mean, what's there to think Here about? We go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So that was really that 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 surprised me that that was has been the scariest thing so far. The other thing that I think is interesting, I started this business with the idea that it would be impossible to do it. Mm -hmm. With the, I, I with with the idea like this is going to suck. Like it's going to be so much work, it's going to be almost impossible. And so coming at it from that mindset, to me, I'm like, wow, this is like way easier than I thought it was going to be mm. because I'm coming at it with this mindset. I'm like, this is going to be basically impossible to do. And now I feel like I'm like, every time something challenging comes up, I'm like, that wasn't as bad right. as I thought it was going to be, or that wasn't as challenging or that wasn't as scary. And I think that has been a shock to me. Do you have a feel of fear of failure? Yes, I would say yes. I also have a healthy fear of success as well, um, because I think that's almost scarier to me is because um, failure is certain, right? My fear of failure, it's like that's going to be realized eventually. You are going to fail in many, many, many ways along this journey, especially like having a startup. You will fail in many ways. But the scarier thing is like, what if I succeed? <laughs> that's so scary to me. I'm like, because that's so open-ended and uh, you could go anywhere with that. Um, but failure is certain. So it's like, yeah, you can be afraid of it, but like you're going to fail in some ways. Even if your startup is totally successful, you will face very, very many setbacks and failures along the way. So yeah. it's nerve wracking. But to me, the, the greater fear is like, what if, what if this is really, really successful? Then what? Then what? Yeah. <laughs> the opportunities are endless, right? Exactly. Right, exactly. <laughs> I think that's awesome. So what do you want your legacy to be? Hmm. Or have you thought about it? Yes, I think about – well, I think being mindful of what you want your legacy to be allows you to, like, be your like, – it, it motivates you to, like, be your best self mm -hmm. as much of the time as possible and to not, like, fall into, like, toxic – traps of, of a manager or of this or that. So my legacy, I want to build an engineering culture or really a culture at Dwellwell. Um, like I said, that's inclusive, motivating. People want to come to work. People are excited by our mission. I want to help home buyers, right? Mm -hmm. I want to help the people that we're trying to help. I want to get them into homes and have them feel good about it. I want to bring education to populations that typically haven't had generational wealth. And so the, the access to agents and education might not be there, which is another thing we're doing with Dwellwell, right? We're educational platform to kind of bring education to people who, like I said, don't have historical ties to financial advisors, or maybe they're the first person who's ever bought a house in their family. And they're like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. um, that's really important to me. And uh, yeah, building an inclusive culture that make people reflect on it and say, man, my time working at Dwell or with Sam was some of like the happiest times of, of my professional life. Right. And she made a difference in my life or yeah. career. So there are two more subjects that I want to cover. And one of them is market research or um, user research, like how important 
I think you did quite a bit of user research before yeah. you launched or started building. So how important and impactful is that research? So important. I, and it continues to be important. So we interviewed probably, probably did like 80 hours of first time home buyer interviews. And then we did some agent interviews as well. Um, how did you get for some people that are, they're starting, they're thinking of a product or they're thinking of something they want to build. They need to get research or they need to get it validated. Is there a need for it in the market? Like, where do you get your subject matter? I mean, so people. you probably know this better than anyone. People love talking about themselves. So we didn't have any. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> they do. <laughs> we didn't have any issue finding like subjects. So basically, we I would reach out to our friends who kind of recently had bought a home and were like, hey, can we interview you? We have this set of questions that we want to ask you. Um, and then by the end of the call, they'd be like, oh, my three friends who you don't know also just bought a house. You should talk to them. And so especially if it's like a problem, people like love complaining about something that sucked. Um, we we had made so it was live conversations, not oh, yeah. survey yep. type things. OK, not surveys. It was live conversations okay. an hour. Sometimes it would go over. Some people were so into it. They would talk for like three hours and you could really get you know, get deep with them. Yeah, we did not run surveys or anything like that. But it was interesting because it really validated our thoughts around this, which out of like the 80 people that we interviewed, like, I think it was something like two of them, we were like, how did you celebrate moving into your home? And only two people were like, yeah, we celebrated. And we were like, really? We were like, why? And they're like, well, the for the people who didn't celebrate, they're like, well, I was just glad this process was over. It was such a nightmare oh, that I didn't even have the stressful. energy to celebrate. So we're like, that's what if we could bad. change what if we could yeah. change that, right? With yeah. Dwell Well. Did the research change your strategy at all? Yeah, it did because we weren't quite sure what we were going to build at that point. There's a lot of places you can go in real estate. Like there's a thousand problems that need to be solved. Mm -hmm. And the main thing that we kept hearing over and over again was, I wish there was just a checklist of um, things that I needed to do and in what order. Yeah. And we were like, well, that's easy to build. Right. And yeah. why don't we just build that and then start making it programmatic and then start guiding people and then start making recommendations and then start like using the data about the, the our home buyer to make good recommendations and introductions to agents. I mean, so yeah, yeah. it it did help us solidify our product thinking around it for sure. Yeah. And then the last subject, which we're kind of going backwards, but I just think that it could impact so many people. So back to whenever you got your first job and we were talking about this before we got on. Um, and you landed this job, but you didn't have a place to live. And so you took a big gulp of humble pie, I think, like ate the whole pie, in my opinion. Um, and you had to ask your new employer if you could stay sleep at the office because you didn't have a place to live. Oh, like, yeah. I think that takes more guts. I don't know. I think that takes a lot of guts. And they said yes. So I guess it's it's a testimony to whatever you're going through, regardless if you think it's impossible. It never hurts to ask, one. And how do you look back on that? And what do you learn or take away from that? And what would you tell others? Great question. Yeah. Oh, my God. Big, big question. Yeah. And I was with my dog, too, by the way, who I had to sleep in the office with my dog. I was like, yeah. So basically how it happened, I... I accepted this job and as I'm driving from the job was in Los Angeles. So as I'm driving with from San Francisco to LA, I have like $200 to my name. I have like nothing. Um, I do want to preface this all and saying I could have asked my parents for help. Like I, I am privileged in that if I had wanted to ask my parents for help or for money, I'm sure they could have put me up somewhere. But I was like, no, this is my thing. Like I took this risk. I'm going to eat it. And like, I'm not asking for help on this. And so as I was driving down, I'm like calling or I texted him because I was too afraid to call him. I sent him an email and I was like, 
I'm on my way down. Like, just so you know, I don't have a place to stay. This is after you accepted the job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I was like, what yeah. are we going to do? Pull the job off or no? <laughs> and so, so I was like, what do you think about that? Like, can I stay in the office? And they're like, yeah, sure thing. Literally, it was like a no brand. They didn't even care. And I was like, humiliate. I'm like, also, right after the boot camp, I'm like, in my head, I'm like, I've tricked these people into hiring me. First of all, I don't really know how to code. And now I'm like also living in the office. Like what, like what a way to <laughs> with start With my off dog. Here. Yeah, with my dog. <laughs> what a way to start it off. And so, but I look back on that time. I mean, I was so loyal to my boss, the co-founder of that company, yeah. to the company in general. He's still a really good friend of mine. He's at, an advisor at my company now. Um you know, it's it's so interesting that 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 kindness and um, their own humility really set the tone for how I want to act in my career. Mm -hmm. And so, just having people be so kind and accommodating to me at the beginning of of my career has fundamentally changed like how I exist in the world as a human, how I am as a boss, how I am as a friend, how I am um, running this company. Um, I, I think if I hadn't, if that example hadn't been set for me, I wonder where I would be or how I would exist. So I'm really thankful that that was my first kind of experience in tech. Yeah, it's such an amazing story. Okay, so how can we help you? How, what can we do to help you succeed? Oh, thank you for asking. So if you are listening to this and you are an SDR or someone who is kind of you know, you're considering sales, we're hiring two kind of junior SDRs. So people with a year of experience doing sales, um, we'd love to bring you on as part of the founding team. And then we're also looking for a front end engineer. So React, TypeScript, Redux is kind of our front end stack. Uh, we are located in Los Angeles. And so we're asking the founding team to be in LA or willing to relocate just because we have to move quickly. As we grow, we may consider remote work and, and all of that stuff. But right now, that's not in our considerations. And then beyond that, if you're listening to this and you and you said, damn, that's so true. I don't know how to buy a house and I'm trying to buy a house in the next six months and I have no idea what I'm doing. Sign up for Dwellwell. We're in our private beta right now. So working through a couple last minute kind of product iterations and features, we're probably going to be launching our public beta upcoming in the next couple months. So then anyone can just join. Okay. Um, but if the mission resonates with you and you say, yeah, I really have no idea what I'm doing and I wish someone would walk me through the process step by step, then we are the platform for you. And um, where be can they find you all? Is it dwellwell.com? Is that the best place yep. to go? Okay. Dwellwell.com is the best place to go. Okay. Um, and then kind of an aside, not having to do with me, if you are somebody who works in tech listening to this and you want to get involved in mentoring people who are new to tech, the mentors that exist in people's, like at the start of people's careers, shape how that person exists in the world like forever pretty much and so if you are someone who's been kind of oh, maybe I should get into mentoring young developers I highly encourage you to do so and the the two places the place I spent the most time mentoring is Hackbright Academy which is a all women's coding boot camp um, I've probably mentored there for three years or something like that I would highly encourage people who are listening to get into mentorship if you have a couple hours a week to dedicate to, to people who are new in tech. Um, that's my final ask is yeah. to help help the world go around and help these people who are new kind of. Get I, that's footing. awesome. What's the second one? You said Hackbright, Hackbright Academy. Is there another one? Yeah. Well, I love Hack Reactor. Um, I've never mentored for them, but they spit out some amazing JavaScript developers. So I just really like hiring from, from both these two boot camps that I mentioned. But okay. um, I'm pretty okay. certain they probably have a mentorship program as well. Um, awesome. Okay. And you're going to have to keep us posted on when the public, when it's ready for launch. I would love outside to. Of the bank. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, and we're excited. Now, one quick question just for people that are going to buy a house and they want to run to your website and sign up. Is it free for the consumer mm -hmm. to do all of this? 
Oh, yeah. Totally okay. free. Free for the consumer. Don't worry about it. You can get all of our educational content for free. We'll match you up for free. All that good stuff. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a fantastic time and you, you guys are doing great things. We're excited to see you grow. Keep us posted on the launch. And if you ever Hello. need anything, feel free to reach out. Of course. Thanks so much for having me, Brooke. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Wild Feather. Be authentic, be limitless, and love yourself. Thank you.